Mr. Kip Sorensen, what's up, brother? Good, man. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We're doing this on uh, New Year's Eve, which is I, – I usually – it's funny. Every year I say I'm not going to work on New Year's. I'm not going to work on – did I say New Year's Eve? I meant Christmas Eve if I said yeah. New Year's Eve. Um, at, you know, I'm not going to work on Christmas Eve. I'm not going to work on Christmas. I'm not going to work on New Year's. And every year I work. But I enjoy it. So that's why I'm here. I, I enjoy what I do, and I imagine – well, you do to some degree. Otherwise, you wouldn't have uh, agreed to do it today. Totally. Uh, like I mentioned earlier before we hit record, I, I'm i happy. I'm happy that we're doing this recording yeah, today. Man. So yeah. it, uh, it's good. And I think the release of this one will be January 1st if I have my calendar dates correct, which means that uh, we are the very start of the new year, which is it's a beautiful thing. It's a good time to be alive right now. Time to get going. By the way, Kip, I wanted to say thank you. I got this in the mail today. Yeah. So thank you for my gift. I'm really excited about it. Honestly, I've just looked at like one page and then I had to jump on the call with you. Trish brought it in. So that was really, really thoughtful. I appreciate that, man. Oh, and no uh, my whole goal is to study this, to uh, use everything in here against you. Awesome. So um, I, you'll I have to let me know how time. it works. Yeah. I <laughs> well, you know, that's a beautiful time. thing too is like, Sometimes when you're rolling in jujitsu, it's like, you know, you feel good because somebody, because you might be better than somebody. And then you're like, wait a second. Like the goal isn't to feel good about yourself. <laughs> the goal is to improve. So you better go roll with somebody who's not better than you. Or this morning I was rolling with a guy, man, this guy is, his name's Alex Tuttle. He's, uh, you would, you'd really like this guy. Actually, he, he's never trained jujitsu. And I was introduced to him by somebody, uh, Benjamin, that we met at Origins Immersion Camp last year, okay. or, or earlier this year, rather, or I guess last year, because now we're in 2020. <laughs> it's going to confuse me for a little while. <clears throat> um, and so he's like, hey, I've got a buddy. He's never trained. I'm like, cool, like have him come in the morning and you know, we'll, we'll just roll and I'll teach him what little I know, but it'll yeah. just be good for him. Well, this guy goes to compete. He's never trained before. He goes to in a competition. He wins his division. It's awesome. And awesome. Amazing. <clears throat> so I'm like, holy cow, this guy's like, maybe he's a wrestler. He's got some yeah. other experience. No, he's just a big, strong, athletic dude. So no wrestling background. <clears throat> no wrestling background. <laughs> he took I just assumed. A, yeah. No, yeah, that's what I would have thought. He took a couple of uh, a couple of classes years ago. Him and his buddies took a couple of jujitsu classes, but never trained. Yeah, so I'm rolling with him and <clears> – um, you know, I'm able to, to hold my own just because I've been training for a little while now and that, that wasn't, wasn't an issue, but man, the guy's big and strong and I'm like, holy cow, like some of the guys that I roll with, even if they're new, they're just tough guys. Anyways, the reason I bring it up is because we actually trained this morning, which again, we're recording this on Christmas Eve <clears throat> and uh, it was funny because I was sitting there just coaching a little bit to the degree that I could. Like I, I don't coach anything I wouldn't know, but just some basic things and it's interesting because you're training somebody else to hurt you, right? So then the next roll session, we get going again, and he starts doing some of the things that I was t teaching him. I'm like, damn it. I shouldn't have taught him those things. <laughs> yeah. It, it's funny how it's, – it, it's really interesting that you bring this up because I just thought about this literally like a couple days ago because I've been out with my, my rib injury, and I'm coming back to the gym, and the thought crossed my mind is how good am I going to go against my – my teammates. Mm. And then I thought, wait a mm. second, I'm going to the school to become better so I can defend myself and or compete outside the school. The objective yes. isn't for me to go to the school and stroke my ego and try to be better than my teammates. Right. Like, right. and, and I kind of had to put myself in that spot a little bit and go, okay, you know, readjust my focus here. This is not about me leveling up. Like I want to do good against my teammates, but it should for, be from a position of bettering them and bettering myself, not showing up because when guys show up at the gym to try to prove something in the gym, then it's ego mm -hmm. and, and their role is going to be different than it is going to be from the perspective of learning. And it's funny how often I've thought that same thing. Whenever I show someone like my game, uh, like a move I love, I'm like, a little bit at, in the moment, I'm thinking I should not be showing them this right. <laughs> because they're going to shut it down now. And now they'll know my, my secrets, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And then they use it against you. But again, the yeah. goal, I mean, this is, 
look, we're talking about obviously jujitsu right now, but it's, yeah. it's bigger than that. And, and the goal, you know, we fall into these comparison traps, right? We compare ourselves to the people around us. That's not a great comparison. And, and I actually think there's moments where you should compare yourself to other people. And that's yeah. contrary to popular belief. Everybody says, oh, don't compare. That's the, it's the thief of joy or whatever. Be happy with who you right. are. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? Like I actually, there's people that I admire and respect that I, I don't compare my worth to theirs. That's not what I'm saying. But I compare their skill set, whatever that skill set is. So if it's public speaking or if it's jujitsu or if it's running a business or leading their family, I look at their skill set they're using and I think, well, that's an individual that I admire, res I respect. And I want to create something similar to what that person's doing. So I use comparisons, comparison as an opportunity to see what's available and what capacity I could be operating at. Because what happens is sometimes we get stuck in these little bubbles, right, of, of our own lives and our own performance. And then we're measuring ourselves against our peers. And I think more often than not, when we do that, we set the bar lower than it should be set. And if we turn outwards and compare to what else is possible, again, not worth of a, of a human soul, but what is possible from a skill set perspective, then we raise and elevate that bar. But most of us don't do it because, well, it sucks, right? It sucks <laughs> yeah. to say, well, I'm not as good as that guy. It's way better to say, well, I'm better than that guy. Yeah. So we play a, a weaker game an inferior game so we can stroke our ego rather than playing the elevated game that we know we may be on the bottom of the totem pole with. Yeah. It's funny too, that one of those scenarios causes, like, I think when you look at an individual and you're focused on the worth aspect, right. In regards to my worth versus his worth, it has a tendency to overshadow the efforts that that person had to put in place to be in that position. When you, when you say, Oh, they're worth more. I'm worth more. You're not considering all the work necessary to get into the position that they're in because you're saying that that worth is just that way. And that work, it's almost like you're, you're avoiding the idea that it took effort to get into those positions versus when I look at like this morning, <laughs> this is really an interesting conversation. Cause this is like relating to my day already this morning. I went to the gym. I saw my good, my good buddy, Jimmy. And he's just yoked, right? This, this guy's just shredded. And, and I show up at the gym, I'm feeling weak and skinny or whatever. And it bothered me a little bit initially. And it bothered me from the position of almost like unfair, like, man, why is Jimmy so yoked and I'm not? Versus if I looked at it from the position of, man, he's putting the time in. What right. is he doing? What, what can I ask Jimmy about to be able to, you know what I mean? Improve my workouts and get, and be able to put in the work to be, you know, in a better shape, you know, like he is. And, and, and I, we have a tendency to, when we go on the worth path of measuring worth, I think we overshadow or we look past all the effort necessary to get into those positions. It's really agreed. interesting that we do that. Yeah. Agreed. I think yeah. I, I run into this a lot with the podcast. People say, Oh, Ryan, you know, you're so lucky you have this podcast or, you know, you're lucky you get to talk with all these amazing men or, you know, you're, you're lucky that you're naturally uh, able to hold a conversation or to be able to present or communicate in beard. public. It's like, yeah, grow a beard. You know, it's like I had to work for this, <laughs> not the beard part, but everything <laughs> else. Like I had I had to work. The yeah. beard was just absence of work. Like I literally had to do nothing. <laughs> um, but, you know, like with regards to – we just have to be careful of, to your point, discounting what it took somebody else. And when people say, oh, people are naturally gifted or in their genetics, you know, maybe, maybe there's an element of truth to that. Like there's certainly people just on this path that I've been doing with the jujitsu, there's certain people who are more athletic than other people yeah, or, or more intuitive. They, they just pick things up quicker. It, it just, for whatever reason, plays to their strengths. But I know plenty of gifted, talented, strong, athletic men who frankly haven't amounted to much. So yeah. it isn't that that's the de de determination of success. It's the fact that they took a skill, ability, a talent, a gift, whatever you want to call it, and then they applied it effectively and consistently over time that has yielded the results. Yeah. So we got to be careful of discounting w somebody's work because what that does, let's talk about why that's important. If 
if I discount Kip, what it took you to get to where you are, I give myself an out, right? Because I'm, I get to say, well, you know, the reason I'm not as successful as Kip and fill in the blank with the endeavor is because, you know, my ship just hasn't come in or God didn't gift me with these natural abilities or I didn't get lucky like he did. And so you excuse and absolve yourself of the responsibility of doing the work required to have your thing. And even if you, even if it is true that people have gifts and abilities and talents that they're born with, innately born with, like that doesn't serve you to compare it to them because maybe you weren't. So, okay, find what you were gifted with. Like I was thinking about it today about ego. Um, I was listening to a Jocko podcast and he was talking, it was his new podcast, Grounded. I don't know if you've listened to it at I all. I actually know he started a yeah, podcast. Yeah, most people don't. It's really okay. good. It's it's way more con- conversational, way more casual, I should say. He talks a lot yeah. about jujitsu. It's really good. Jocko he was, talks about jujitsu on his believe podcast? Believe it or not. Yes, yeah, crazy, <laughs> right? It's more, I, I, I meant the theme is jujitsu. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, but uh, he was talking with Dave Burke, and they were talking about ego, and I was like, and and he asked if Dave's ego ever got in the way, and and I was asked myself the same question, and yes, sometimes it does, but I was as I was thinking about it this morning, I was thinking to myself, like I've honestly never been so good at something that ego ever got in the way. Yeah, <laughs> like I feel like I've had to claw and scrape and. And, and scrap and fight and bite for every advantage I've ever had. Like I've never felt like, oh, I have this superior advantage in business or communication or looks or wealth or connections or ability. Like I've had for everything. So that ego has really been kept in check pretty much my whole life. Well, but that's because you had to put the work in to be good in those things, which by default takes away ego, right? It's like, you, you look at black belts and they're so humble. Why? Because they've been humbled for 10 years before yeah. they ever got that black belt. So it's not possible. I don't think so. I don't think it's possible to exceed in certain areas of life and still have ego around because mm-hmm. you had to learn to let go of your ego to even be placed in that position. Ego is really shows up when you don't have the skill set. It shows up when you think you're great, even though you didn't put the work in it. It's yes. superficial in most right. cases. Well, that's the difference between confidence and ego or, yeah. Or, or yeah, I'd say confidence and ego confidence is earned. Like you earn the right to be confident through application of skills and mastery. Ego is, is in, inflated, right? It's, it's, it's not, it's not a real thing. You know, you did say something interesting. You said it's just not around. And, and I I would disagree with that a little bit, but I think it's just the wording that you used. I think you'd agree with this as well, maybe not, is it's not that it's not around. Like I think our natural tendency mm. is to defend our fragile egos and, and boister ourselves up. So it's not that it's not around. I think it's those who are successful have found ways to combat it when it comes up. To keep it in check. Yeah, That's I right. agree. Yeah. It's not something that just – it's not like a temptation that you fought it so long that now you never have to fight it anymore. It just isn't present. No, it will always be present, especially I've noticed as you get better at something because then there's expectations. Yeah. Right, because this podcast, for example, has done fairly well. Now I place all of this emphasis and and pressure to continue to perform, to continue to elevate it, which is good. It's really good. But taken to the extreme, I might do things that would keep play it safe in a way in order to – it's it's in a way playing not to lose at yeah. that point. Totally. And, and to defend your ego. Yeah, totally. I get my brown belt. Now what, what the, what's the pressure? Right. Shit, I, I better not get tapped by a purple. Can't be now. tapped by a purple or a I blue. Not no be way. by blue. And, and, and here's the thing. What if I'm at risk of getting tapped by a purple? What, what is, what am I willing to do to ensure I don't get tapped, get hurt, avoid mm. rolling with that guy maybe because I'm going to look bad. Like it, you start putting yourself in a position where you go, shit, you know, I'm going to look bad in these circumstances if this guy catches me. So I'm going to roll it maybe extra aggressive. I may not work on my game. If there's a loose spot in my game, I may not open myself up to be caught in those areas because why? Got to, got to protect my ego. Yeah. 
Get, yeah, get so you won't tapped, take those right? calculated risks to learn new things. Yeah, totally. Interesting. And I think it transcends like all over the place, right? Yeah. yeah. Hey, cool. So really quick, uh, and not to, not to talk about how great my gift is, um, is great, but though. what's cool about that gift, so they don't even make those books anymore. Oh, is that right? Correct. So, cool. so I'll sell it for more. What did you buy? How much did you buy it for? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I can't tell you. Uh, but so that's what's cool about that book. So Pedro Sauer guys that might be listening. So if you're part of the Pedro Sauer curriculum, um, those moves are our belt tests. Mm. So, so by the time when I, by the time I test for my black, I have tested all those moves in that book. Interesting. So does it go by, does it go by belt or no, no. Okay. It's, it's, it's not, not a beginner curriculum. thing, right? No, yeah. but he covers Halio. It's, I mean, Halio created that book, right? So right. that's yeah. just awesome in itself. But, um, but a lot of these are like the old school, like traditional self-defense jujitsu stuff, just super old school yeah. stuff. It's, it's really cool. I'm, like you're not going to find spider really guard in here and X guard and deep half. Well, maybe a little bit of deep half, but it's a lot of, I mean, you'll find a section in there. It's about like gun defense and knife attacks and, you know, kind of really solid fun old school jujitsu moves so yeah man i'm excited yeah. to go through it yeah cool so i was All lucky right, well, was actually we... lucky to find one so well no i'm i'm uh i'm lucky to have a friend that would uh <laughs> have this thoughtful gift no truly that's what i told my wife when she gave it to me i'm like man this is like really thoughtful and that's um that's a meaningful gift like it's not I... the gift itself the gift is cool but the thoughtfulness behind it is really cool well, and it made it easy now that uh, it made it easier with you on the jujitsu path because I I can now relate of what would be a grateful, thoughtful gift. <laughs> yes, yes, because so. we couldn't relate before. Nope. There was no connection nope. there at all. No connection till now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, should we get into some questions? Yeah, let's do we it. We crushed like a a, a quarter Damn. of our time today, just like that, a third yeah, of we it. We don't actually. even need questions. I, yeah, I'm man, questioning. Just ramble. <laughs> Just ramble. I'm sure people would appreciate that. Yeah. Actually, they probably would. Yeah. You, well, you guys tell us. All right. Should we do no, it? Don't tell us. Yeah. Just deal with it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, let's go. Aaron Goats, what are both of your thoughts on government regulation of pornography, particularly with respects to protecting children from being exposed to porn? There's a school of thought that pornography is a form of speech and thus cannot and should not be regulated. There's another school of thought that pornography has a, a significant harmful effects on the uh, on its viewers, which is backed by scientific studies, and thus should be regulated like alcohol, drugs, and other vices. Well, I think there is some regulation on pornography. Number one, I mean, I I think there's already some regulation in place. Now, when it comes to children, yes, I do believe that we should make a very conscious and concerted effort to protect our children from dangers that they may not be fully aware of and not fully how to handle. But a grown man engaging in, in watching pornography, I, I tend to be more of a libertarian when it comes to that. Yeah. If he wants to, if he want, like, I, I don't think it's good. I don't think it's healthy. And I agree with those scientific studies that show that it has damaging effects on the brain. It rewires our circuits. It uh, makes us think differently of women. Um, it changes the dynamic with intimacy and sex. Uh, it 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 just robs us of a lot of our masculine energy and power. There's a lot that comes with pornography, but I, I also think you know if a guy chooses to engage in that behavior, then okay, well that's that's his prerogative. You know that's I I I think less government is the solution. I don't really believe that we should get the government involved, and I don't think we need the government involved in every aspect of our lives. Like it's unfortunate to me that. We live in this world that like needs somebody else to self-regulate, not even self-regulate, to regulate us because we cannot self-regulate. Yeah. Like morality has just gone completely out the window. And I'm not just talking about pornography, but I'm talking about cheating, integrity issues, that kind of stuff outside of just pornography. It's, it's not good and it's not healthy. So I, I'd rather take this approach. And that's why people ask me, oh, are you going to get into politics? You're going to do that? No, I, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in doing this and then having men who are voluntarily interested in joining our mission of protecting and reclaiming and restoring genuine masculinity 
that, that we do it this way voluntarily as opposed to being regulated. The problem with regulation is it just doesn't work, right? It, it, it just doesn't work. And then what ends up happening is, is as you get more legislation and more laws in the book, we look for little ways to maneuver and move around that. And then we, more laws have to be put on the books and then more and more and more. And it's this big snowball. And then it sets a precedent for what else can be regulated? What else can be opened up to regulation through government uh, entities? And I'm, I'm just not interested in involving the government more in our lives than they already are. Yeah. Protecting children. Yes. There's tons of private organizations that are working on that too. And that's why I think you need to have an engaged mother and father in the home so they can start incorporating some of these things on their own voluntarily. And that's a better solution than having the government do it. Well, people will say, well, what about the kids that don't have, that don't have parents? That's why I think some regulation for children, but grown men can make their own decisions. It's just yeah. not that hard. It's like I was telling my son a, a few weeks back, like, you know, we were talking about something about some law and I'm like, just always remember this with regulation and law comes a reduction of freedom, period. That is reality by design. So be, by, so be very careful when we jump on some train that goes, yeah, let's regulate this. Let's create a law. It's like, you're taking a little bit of freedom. You're taking a little mm -hmm. bit of freedom. Like just always remember that. And, and I, and I, you and I are totally in the same camp here. It's like, I'm, I'm totally, I totally believe that pornography is not good, but I still want to have the government be regulating anything right. um, in, in that regard, because I, I think that's where we can make a better impact socially on our own through non government regulation and process and, and allow people to make that choice and see the value of why they shouldn't be doing it. Right. So it's interesting to me, you know, some of these it's intellectually dishonest to say on one hand that there we should have limited and small government, the government shouldn't be involved in every aspect of our lives, that we should be allowed certain uh, choices or religious freedoms. Uh, and then on the other hand, say, but in this case, because I don't agree with it, that it should be regulated. It's I like, know. no, 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 no. Like your thoughts should apply, apply broadly unless it's impacting somebody else. Yeah. It should, it should apply broadly and and not like pick and choose because then it doesn't seem very principled to me. No. It just seems like you want to regulate things that you don't agree with, but you're fine if people leave alone the things that you do agree with. So yeah. it, it's 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 not a it's it, it's not a very it's not an integrity with with your supposed principles of liberty and freedom if you're picking and choosing what the government should and shouldn't get involved in. Yeah. And everyone that's like on some mission of we need to instigate some re uh, government regulation to, you know, change this process. Stop. Like actually just create an organization and get a movement going, communicate the values of whatever you're passionate about and try to make change that way. In a mm -hmm. lot of cases, it's going to be more effective anyway. And let's be honest. Do we want to do things because our government, quote unquote, lets us or does not let us do something? Or do we want to be educated so we can make that decision on our own? Well, it's funny because a lot of people talk about God as not existing or being, you know, false or, or conceived, and yet they're willing to concede to the God of government, right? <laughs> so they've gotten a r rid of God and instead replaced it with but let's the have government. government tell us what government. To do. Yeah. So then that becomes their God or their religion. And yeah. that's just as destructive as they believe some other organized religion may be. Yeah. Huh. Very interesting. All right. Alan Placer, sovereignty alone doesn't make men overcome their fears. What eternal process did it take to convince you and Kip to make the leap into the unknown that is your careers today? What's well, not a leap? <laughs> that's what that's that's Hmm. How would I word this? That is a thought that will keep you from doing it. Because when I think of leap, I think of leap and like fall to my death. <laughs> right? Like you're, you're, you're bridging some gap that, that inherently possesses a bunch of risk and because and unknown, it has yeah. an unknown, right. <clears throat> and because of all of this risk, then you might fail and suffer catastrophically. So it's not a leap. It's a step. It's a, guys, it's just a step. If you're trying to lose weight or fix your marriage or start a business or secure a promotion or do any number of things that you're trying to do, 
you don't have to have it all figured out right now. I, this is what guys do. It's, it's just, it's funny. And when I share it, people think it's asinine, but I guarantee all of us have, have engaged in this line of thinking. They think because they can't have the ultimate result that they desire or even the ultimate uh, effort they wish they could give right now that they just won't do anything. So let me give you two very small examples of how this might work. In my financial planning practice, I would have people who would say, Ryan, I, I know I need a financial plan. I know I need to get my money situation taken care of. I would love to shore all this up and get this taken care of. But before I start working with you, I just want to get a few things with my finances figured out. <laughs> it's like, that's what I'm going to help you do. Like I'm going to help you do that. Another one people say is, uh, yeah, man, I just, I want to go into the gym and I want to start lifting and getting strong and getting fit and lean. Uh, I just, I need to lose, lose some weight before I go to the gym. Yeah. And they'll what the say hell that about do you think? your <laughs> jujitsu, like, they'll say that too. Yeah. I need yes. to get in shape before I start training. You're like, right. uh, that's how you get in shape. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's part of the process. So to Alan's question, you, I didn't take a leap. I think he said, what internal principle did I use? Or is that what he internal, said? What internal process did it take to convince you to take the leap? Okay. So no leap, right? That's the first thing. The process is what's the next first step. So I thought of it in micro steps, not, not even steps of the process. I just thought of it in micro steps. What do I need to do next? Okay. Do that. Then when that's completed, what do I need to do next? Okay. Do that. What do I need to do next? And you start tacking these things together. That becomes the process. And what's interesting is a lot of the, a lot of the times you don't even know where it will take you. Yeah. Or what it, opportunities will present themselves along the way. How could you know? You've yeah. never been down that path before. You've never seen the routes and the trails and everything else that, that could, you know, come off of this path that you've decided to walk. And you don't get to see it. Here's the interesting thing. You don't get to see those opportunities until you start walking. Like it's, it's like a, like a veil over the, over the path. Like you don't get to like peek around the corner and see what's available. You got to actually start taking the path and then you're like, Oh, that's a cool opportunity. Oh, Whoa. I didn't even know that existed. Oh, here's a relationship. I never would have thought I had. Oh, here's a project that I could engage in that I never thought would be something even remotely on my radar because you just start taking the, the steps, the necessary steps of the path that you think you're meant to walk. You may find out you're on the wrong path, but it's always prudent to take a step because then you just take the next step. And learning to take steps is, I believe, just as important as the actual step that you're taking. Yeah. It's the habit, it's the conditioning of your mind to move and take action. And you know what? If you do it this way, like I did it with the podcast. I started the podcast for my financial planning practice. One which step, would have been so boring, by the way. <laughs> completely boring, <laughs> which is probably why it didn't do that well. <laughs> but I liked the medium of podcasting. I just didn't want to have that boring conversation again Yeah. that I've had a million times before. <laughs> But I wouldn't have known about the opportunities that we've created here with Order of Man until I took that step. And then I just pivoted. I'm like, okay, well, yeah, okay, that didn't work. But I like podcasting. Now I know how to podcast. Now let's shift gears. Yeah. So be careful of thinking it's a leap, number one. Be ca and then as far as the internal processes, just what's the next first step? What is it? Okay, I want to – like I, I'm challenging guys right now. We're January 1st. Like you're, you've got – things that you want to do, right? So write down those things you want to do in the next 90 days or the next year. I don't care what it looks like. Just write those things down and then pick one. You don't have to do all of them right now. Just pick one of them. Okay. I want to lose 20 pounds. Cool. What's the next first step? Then do it. The next first step is maybe it's find a gym near you. Cool. That'll take you what? 20 minutes. Got it. Gym. What's the next first step? call them and get a membership easy. That'll take you five minutes. Next first step. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I guess I need some shorts. Cool. Go and get some shorts out of your, your, your dresser or some shoes. Maybe you got to buy something cause you don't have anything. You haven't been into the gym, whatever. Cool. Got that done. What's the next first step? 
oh, I need to know how to, how to work out. Okay, well, call the gym up. Maybe they have somebody there or look online. Cool, got that. What's the next step? Go into the gym. Then what's the next step the next day? Do that over and over and over and over again. That's the process. Yeah, I like it. The only thing I'd ask, you know, I thought you would say calculated risk. I, I think you've used that term in the past a lot. It's like it's about calculated, right? You, you, you didn't leap into something. It's, it's something that you considered, you calculated, and maybe it did have some risk. And to that thought process, I would just like to add that sometimes risk is perceived, Right. When, when I, when I had my own business and I'd hire an employee, I'd, I'd had guys that would be like, oh man, I, I think I'm going to go work for a large corporation because you know, you're a smaller company and that comes with risk. And, and I remember having this conversation with them all the time. It's like, based upon what, like, why is that risky? Oh, because you're a smaller company. Really? Let's, let's hash through this. You can work for a large corporation of thousands of employees and be amazing. But the correlation between you keeping your job and the hard work that you do is more removed than if you work for a company with 10 employees and you're working hard. There's, right. there's a more exact correlation to your hard work and the company staying afloat than if you work for a corporation. So you tell me what the risk is, right? So we have a tendency sometimes to see things as risk when reality, all it is is perceived risk based upon limited information and not reality. So be really careful on, on how we identify what is risky and what is not. Because in a lot of cases, I think it's, it's based on limited information and not reality. Well, and it's not that it, it inherently possesses less risk. It's just different risk where you currently are because there's risk where you currently are. When we moved out here to Maine, people said, oh, I can't believe you're doing that. That's risky. That's risky. Well, it possesses an element of risk, but risky compared to what? Risky yeah. compared to staying in the status quo and never reaching our full potential or never experience, uh, experiencing anything new or never going on this grand adventure. Like it's risky compared to what? Like it's risky compared to, uh, it's not, I don't think it's risky at all. It's just a different level of risk and you have to be willing to assume some level of risk to, to have some, some potential reward. Yeah. And no decision is still a decision. Right. Yes. It's the decision. To, and, and no decision carries risk too. Yeah. Cause if yeah. you stay where you are, there's also risk. If you stay in the status quo, yeah. it's, it's there, it's present, whether you like it or not, whether you, whether you feel inclined to acknowledge it or not, it's still there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Nate Gant, best practices for creating a vision for my 2020 battle plan. I feel stuck attempting to create a battle plan that is based upon a vision that is no longer the life I wish to live. Uh, create a new vision for yourself. And then that's okay. Yeah. You have permission. I'm not, I'm not giving you permission. I'm just acknowledging or helping you see that you already had permission. You have permission to change, to evolve, to grow, to find value in new endeavors and new things to not feel so obligated to do things that you used to like to do even potentially like you are an evolving human being. And if you don't feel connected to your vision, then nothing else that you're going to do is going to feel meaningful. So let's talk about the hierarchy of the battle plan. So we have vision first, and then we'll talk about some tactical strategies we can use here, but you have vision first. What is it that you want to look like when you think about being a husband or a father or an entrepreneur or a leader within your community or a neighbor or a brother or a son or any number of roles in which you engage, like what does that look like? When you get home, are your kids happy to see you? Are they excited to see you? Are you engaged? Are you present and deliberate and playing with them? Are you and your wife connected? Are you close? Are you physically intimate. And when you're having sex, what does that sex look like? And how are you two feeling? Like, this is the vision. This is the process that you go through. And if you feel like that isn't strong because you no longer identify with that mission or it was never something all that compelling in the first place, change it, change it. You've changed. You have new inputs, new experiences, new ideas, new exposure to information and, and people. Therefore it would make sense that other things would change in your life. So yeah, the first step is the vision. Next step from the vision is objectives. Next is tactics. Next is checkpoints. 
So if you're not connected, change the vision. I think I answered that portion of the question correctly. We can get into some tactical stuff if you feel like I did. Cool. So, yeah. okay. Okay, cool. All right. <clears throat> Tactically, um, just start asking yourself questions about the future. I mean, we have this ability to, to, to think consciously about who we want to be and project ourselves out into some future date and, and time and place even. So what I tell a lot of the guys when they're faced with difficult decisions is I say, project yourself out in 20 years and then looking back, what decision will you be happy that you made? You can do the same thing with a vision. Like think about yourself with a little more gray in your hair, you know, a little older. Think about yourself with grandkids. Think about how you would look or feel or engage if you owned that business or you salvaged that marriage or you had a hat or you were more fit and start tying your, your vision to the emotionally charged elements of it. Like, what does it feel like? What, what experiences are you having? Um, how are people thinking of you? The uh, write your own eulogy is a, a very cool exercise. So you're literally writing out, if somebody was giving a eulogy for you, you're writing it out, how you would be remembered. That'll start to identify some key principles and values in your life that you find meaningful and significant. Then you can start working that into your vision. Think about, um, think about how, how people talk about you when you're not there. That's a good exercise. Think about how you would talk about yourself if you weren't connected. That's an interesting exercise too. So what you do is you think, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to not be me for a minute. I'm going to be objective for a minute. And I'm going to think about me as this guy that's like over there that I know of, but we're not connected in any way. How would you think about that individual? And how would you want to be thought about? Now, I can't tell you you've got to write this formula and answer these five questions and do it in this framework because I've seen an infinite number of visions. And, and if they're compelling, then it's accurate. Yeah. Right? If it compels you – then you've done it correctly. If it doesn't compel you, then write something, draft something, consider and think about something until it is compelling enough to move you in the direction that you want to go. Yeah. Some of you guys, and I don't know why I feel inclined to say this because I, I have talked to a handful of guys that, that sometimes, you know, they think about this stuff and they don't like who they are. They don't probably like that self-evaluation of what they would say about themselves. They may not like how people would talk about them currently today. And, and my only message is you can reinvent yourself. If you don't like it, it's not too late. Like become the man in a way that like people are shocked that for whatever reason, people would say, man, Ryan come 2020. It's like he was a new man. And he changed and became better and he started showing up in this way so drastic that they know that something changed in you. Like, and I, and I really believe we all have that option to, to reinvent ourselves if we don't like what we're seeing in the mirror. Now, it's not easy and we can talk about that kind of stuff, but I do believe that's possible. So if you guys don't like what you're hearing, <laughs> if you don't like what that evaluation looks like, then start today. Change who you are. And, and transform in, into the man that you were meant to be. Yes, yes. Way to tie that in. You, you in a way, could almost create a character, right? So, so think about a character of who you'd want to be. And who, where should you get inspiration from this? From men that you're inspired by. Yeah. Right? So take, take somebody who, who you're inspired by. You know, the guys that I hear a lot of quite a bit is like Jocko Willink and – David Goggins, Cameron Haynes, Joe Rogan. I mean, there's so many people that that people aspire to be like in some capacity. And look, nobody has everything figured out. So pick and choose. Like, okay, you take yeah. a guy like Jocko and you're like, man, that guy inspires me. I'm motivated. I want to be like him. Cool. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's great. So write about him and then just drop your name in it. Yeah. What would Jocko do? 
Yeah, like, <laughs> hey, Jocko's disciplined. He's dedicated. He communicates effectively. He leads this way. And when he speaks, people listen because he has authority and a credibility. And just write everything that you know or at least perceive. You don't know. Yeah. But everything that you perceive about this individual and then just cross out Jocko's name and put Ryan Mickler. Ryan is disciplined. Ryan is committed. Ryan speaks with authority and credibility because he's earned it. Ryan does this and Ryan does that. And when people are around him, they're inspired to, to rise up and take control of their own life. Man, just write about other people and then take elements. Okay, so Jocko's this way and, and, and Kip has the, these thoughts that I haven't thought about and he's compassionate and he's got these other features and, and characteristics that I like and Ryan's got this and and Goggins has got this and whoever, whoever you're inspired by, just write it all down and just replace you with those individuals. Love it. Billy, uh, Al, uh, Trujillo. Ah, uh, sorry, Billy. It's what does, I think it's Trujillo, Tr Trujillo. Trujillo, Trujillo or Trujillo, but I think it's Trujillo. There you go. What well, does really, we need to ask him. I know. Sorry, Billy. I, I should know better. What does your musical workout playlist consist of? <laughs> uh, ben Shapiro, Jocko, <laughs> Andy Frisilla. Occasionally I'll have an a audio book that I'll listen to. You never do the music anymore. No, no more, uh, no more the dance while at the gym. You, no. You're all no. – you've committed to – As if that was a thing at one point. Never at the gym. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you my podcast playlist. Just give me a second here because you guys but, will appreciate but this. But just to clarify, always, always podcast or, or audiobook while working out. You you don't you, – you've given up the music while working out. Yeah, I don't usually listen to music while I work out. I mean unless like it's somebody else's. Like if I'm training, for example, Pete will throw his playlist on and then it's just whatever it is. Because it's playing outside, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So like London Real, Jordan Harbinger – um, Art of Manliness, Cleared Hot, Andy Stumpf, uh, Real AF, Andy Priscilla, who else is good? Rogan, I listened to, not all of his, but some of them, um, yeah, Knock On Podcast, Stephen Mansfield, Jocko, that's about what I listen to. Outside of that, like, if I do listen to music, it might be, I just don't, I don't, I don't listen to a whole lot of music. The only music I really listen to is like uh, Red Dirt Country, but I don't do that when I'm lifting. But that's about it. Hmm. Yeah, I I just listen to like uh, workout music, some hip hop sometimes. Some I, this sounds kind of weird. I do this at work too, like trap music. So it's what kind is of that? Like, I don't even know what that is. Uh, it's I don't know, like a new variation of sounds lame, like techno beats. Yeah, so it's lame. just. Noise, <laughs> noise, just noise. Chris Gatsko just noise, breeze. just noise floating through the air. Uh, you know, I just sometimes I I don't know. I just live better when it's I have some music pounding. And and then the other problem that I run into podcasts when I especially a book actually the a book I was listening to the other day I was like man I, I want to wrap this book up so I'm listening to it while I lift, and I. I kept wanting to stop and take notes while I'm, while I'm working out and it was affecting oh, my, yeah. it was affecting my workout. I'm like, crap, like I need to pay attention cause this is a really good chapter. And then I, then I switched back to music cause I was like, I, I just need mundane stuff. I, I don't want to be thinking, but yeah. Anyhow. All right. There you go. John Jenkinson, you mentioned your sister and mother and uh, your mother in the real Brian Rose interview. What is your relationship with your sister and do you see her often? What does your mother think of what you have created here with the Order of Man and the Iron Council? Um, I actually, I don't see my mom and my sister a whole lot. My mom maybe once or twice a year. She lives on the other side of the country at this point. So she's in California. Uh, but we have a great relationship. We still talk. Uh, my sister and I, not as close as that. You know, we, we, we still – Wish wish each other a happy birthday and you know talk on the holidays and things like that and but we're just we're just not real close and that's you know, that's unfortunate I wish we were a little bit closer but quite honestly I could put well we both could we both could put forth more effort to to develop and shore up that relationship but we just haven't um, as far as what my mom thinks about what I do she loves it she loves it she's been my biggest supporter since day one you know since 
since she brought me into this world. You know, she's always supported me, believed in me, helped me. Um, and she sees the value in what I'm doing. Uh, so, you know, sometimes she does tend to th- maybe take something personal the way I say it, but you know, I explained to her like not, not, none of what I've ever said is a knock against her. I think it'd be hard pressed to find anything I've ever said negative about her. Cause I just don't have those thoughts. She just did an amazing job raising us and in, in difficult circumstances, not worse than necessarily other people, not better than other people, just our circumstances. And, um, you know, she's, she's proud. Ultimately she's just proud of what we've created here. That's awesome. Zach, uh, Zemeck. Do you have any thoughts about how male educators can provide a school environment that is more conductive or conducive, conducive. Mm-hmm. to the development of teenage boys? For example, I don't require students to ask permission to leave our room, but rather have one of those wall mounted touch lights that they, they turn on as they leave and turn off as they return. The boys in particular have taken uh, to pol- policing each other, which I see as a huge step forward in comparing to simply asking for permission to leave. I find that really interesting, his strategy. Um, I would actually like to understand that more. Maybe you have an opinion of why that's, that's unique to boys, that scenario. But anyhow. I don't, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a, a behavioral psychologist or anything, right? Yeah. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> so, but I would say that there's an, there's a new, uh, a new experience there. And, and that's what, that's what boys are interested in. Experiential learning. Yeah. But and they and don't, the, they, uh, Oh, good. Go on. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say, I, are I'm you going to let me answer the question? You're just going <laughs> to keep interrupting me. No, well, I'm ahead. assuming there's a, a level of ownership that goes with that scenario versus asking permission versus, okay, I've been given some responsibility and, and it's on me to regulate and do the responsible thing. Right. But I don't, I think that's true. I think, you know, I'm thinking about when I was a young boy, it's like, you know, just treat you, a teacher can treat a child with respect, you know, a 17 year old kid, an 18 year old kid. I mean, come on, like he can have some flexibility and some responsibility like if you police and baby everything, like that's a problem. And I like what he said about them policing each other. I think that's a really cool idea. The little light that goes on and off. I, I would challenge you to even take that maybe a step further. And I don't even know what that looks like, but maybe it's, you know, like colored lights or something, or, you know, put maybe having some sort of a, like a competition. I, I don't know. Like anytime you can involve guys in competition, anytime you can get the experiences and the senses involved get them out of the classroom and, and get them into the field, whatever the field looks like based on what you're teaching, you're just going to have a much better experience than just trying to teach out of a textbook. Totally. We just don't want to learn that way. And that's why I think boys are part of the reason boys are falling behind in school. And if you look at the metrics, we are not just relative to women, but relative to what we were doing 20, 30, 40 years ago, because we don't want to be put in this box and, and just learn from books and just color within the lines and do it the way that we're told. And then what's interesting is if you color outside of those lines or a, a boy, heaven forbid, he gets a little rowdy because he's excited about things, then we medicate him. Right? It's like, yeah. oh, this kid's not – like he can't focus. It's not that he can't focus. It's that he's just not interested in what you're teaching him. Yeah. Because guess what? He can focus on – chicks all day long (laughs) like he doesn't have a focus problem here (laughs) totally so he focuses on those video games really well that's what i'm saying yeah right so it's not a focus problem it's it's an interest problem it's a teaching problem yeah so i don't have any specific examples other than you know, look at the Boy Scouts. And I, I give the Boy Scouts a lot of flack because they've made some serious, serious missteps. In fact, the Boy Scouts are just done. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I give them credit where credit is due in that getting boys out into nature and getting them involved and getting them shooting and wrestling and building things and being outside. It's no wonder they thrived so much under that, under that, uh, that umbrella of learning. Yeah, totally. Could you imagine, check this out. This, I, I would love this as an experiment. We, maybe we should have him, uh, uh, Zach, you can try this out. How cool would it be if you had a class of boys and you set up fire teams 
Mm, that would be and cool. you you had fire teams within your classroom they held each other accountable and and then there was a competition between fire teams and their collective grade average per That's fire cool, team man. i Dude, like that it would be awesome right yeah, the kids would be like helping each other with the homework and it, it would it would totally change yeah, things and then and then document it so like all the if you can like put test scores and things like that on the board <laughs> like like have some accountability in there, right? Totally. I mean, that's what we do in the Iron Council. Yeah. In fact, don't keep it uh, secret. The month, post that, right? Post yeah. it all. Top board post list. If yeah. you can, I realize there's some red tape that you need to <laughs> jump through here. But have a don't even just call it a scoreboard, guys. Here's a scoreboard. This guy's winning the game right now. Obviously, he's got 100 points. This guy's losing the game. He's got 12. Like, yeah. it is what it is. You want, you can feel bad about that. Maybe you should feel a little bad about that, but now improve. Here's how you do it. And your fire team's going to hold you accountable. It's interesting. It's really cool. I like that idea. Um, in the iron council, all of the month of January, we're talking about competition. So using and fostering competition for means of growth. Yeah. Bring it, bring it on. Joel Garcia, the way we behave reflects on those around us. If you had to pick a top five characteristics or virtues, what would they be? I would say integrity, which I would define as doing what you say you will do. I would say work ethic. So you're you're putting a, a lot of work and, 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 and attention towards the things that you are, are working on. Uh, I would say uh, probably a sense of of learning, like you want to continue an open mind, maybe an open mind would be the best way to say that. That yeah. you want to learn and continue to grow and develop and you're open to learning new things. Growth mindset a little bit. Yeah, man. growth mindset. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to say it. Um, I would say probably a little bit of a chip on your shoulder, mm. which is something that a lot of people probably wouldn't say, but I'm trying to think of how you would word that. But someone that feels like they have something to prove, like like I'm going to grab life by the balls and just like twist and have my way with with yeah. life. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Kind of, yeah, like a little bit of a – I don't know what that is. Just Competitive like drive, yeah, or drive, passion. Yeah. Yes, yes. I think that's four. Um, and then I think this kind of goes in line with the the growth mindset, the open mindedness. But I would say a level of humility that they're willing to to acknowledge that they don't know it all, that they're looking for other people to fill in these gaps, that they recognize what those gaps are, and they're willing to. Uh, acknowledge them and then fix them, shore them up. There's five. I mean, I, I could, love, you could do a bunch, but yeah. there's five that come to mind. I love how like half of those conflict with each other, and that oh, yeah, they can. That that there's a balance of those, right? Yeah, it's interesting. Well, like so, what are the ones that you think conflict? Um, I think the edge, the compassion, the competitiveness, and the humility will sometimes conflict or can conflict with they each can, other. They can, but yeah. if you think about it, they don't have to. In fact, they shouldn't. So if you want to dominate, then you have to be humble. Yeah, because yeah. you're not going to grow. Right. Like when I go – again, we talk about jujitsu, but like when I go to class, I, I study before I go to class because two things. I realize I don't know it all, and I want to I beat somebody. Yeah. tonight. Like I want to go, like I'm going there to like, okay, I'm going to learn this arm bar or this triangle or this whatever. And then I'm going, my goal is to apply it to as many people as possible and, and put them in pain. Yeah. So like, because I, that's, that's the drive, but it's also humble knowing that, okay, I don't know it. Let me pull up YouTube and see what I can find. Or let me pull up this, you know, Gracie university and, and see what they say about it. Yeah. Yeah. They can they can be at odds with each other, but they can also they work very well together. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. All right. Let's take a couple more. All right. Uh, where are we at? All right. Brandon I, Stoll. Actually, let me go yeah. back to that last question. Read the question just one more time. I want to make sure that we address that properly. 
Yeah. Well, he, he starts it off with the sentence of the way we behave reflects on those around us. If you had to pick a top five characteristics or virtues, what would they be? And I'm assuming top five that affect and reflect on those around you. But yeah, I mean, you, I, I may change that list a little bit based on that. I may, yeah. I may change to like compassion. Yeah. Um, empathy would probably be one because that Humility affects people still. more than you're just, your you're having your chip on your shoulder may benefit you specifically a little right. bit more than those around you. Yeah. Right. So based on what, and both of them are, both lists would be good skill sets to develop, but based on your objective, you would put more emphasis on one list potentially than another. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good, good point. Okay. You good there then? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brandon Stoll. Um, I've had facial hair, hair for most of my adult life, but I'm uh, congratulations, Brandon. Yes. Uh, good but I'm letting, <laughs> but I'm letting it get a bit longer now, AKA I'm choosing to be lazy. Any tips for keeping those annoying beard hairs out of my mouth? Side note, how are the order of man beard products coming along? When can we expect to see them on the shelves? <laughs> so beard hairs out of his mouth just trim your mustache. Now look at Kip. Like he's got the sexy stubble going on. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's off his lips. You can see those pearly whites. And then I look have, at me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a tendency, like if my if my mustache grows, I can't I can't stop my mouth from playing with my mustache hairs. You know what well, I'm you, talking about? Like I'm I know all, what you're uh, talking about, but it's just it's because weird. it's new. It's just Is that new. Why? That's okay. all. So yeah, I mean, you and I, like, our beard game is, is very, very different. different. <laughs> if you want to keep your beard hairs out of your mouth, then don't grow them to the degree that I have because it's just not possible. <laughs> like, there's certain foods, sandwiches, for example. I saw a meme going around one time that a guy was trying to, a guy with a beard was trying to eat a sandwich, and basically it was his beard – wrapped in two pieces of bread and he was like eating it which is <laughs> completely true i don't know what it is about sandwiches but sandwiches i eat more of my beard and mustache hair than any other food on the planet that's funny and it's uh, funny that I, i've been exposed to, because of you there's certain things i've never even thought of like and i can't remember what other foods but i've talked to you about this and you're like oh i got to eat that with a fork and i'm like Oh, good point. Like, like I'm pizza. assuming like cheesy nachos or pizza would be a mess. I wouldn't eat che I would not eat cheesy nachos in public. <laughs> I wouldn't do it. I would eat it with my You're closest like in the closet in your house. Like, yeah. No, I would do it in front of my kids, my wife. They'd all be disgusted, but it would be kind of uh, funny. Yeah. But like pizza, I either have to cut it or fold it in half, which some people would argue folding it in a half lengthwise is the proper way to eat yeah. pizza anyway. I eat pizza that way anyway. Yeah. Right. Um, ice creams, like, eh, it's going to be tough. True. The, the, um, my server always looks at me a little funny when I ask for like straw for my water, yeah. even if my wife occasionally she'll make me a hot chocolate at night or something like that. And I'm like, and she'll put a straw in now cause she knows, yeah. but before I'd ask her, can I get a straw? She's like, for your hot chocolate. I'm like, yeah, I need a straw. <laughs> As she, calls dab, you, man. as she calls you princess. Oh, sure. Princess. I'll get you a straw. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So you just adapt. Yeah. You know, it's like if you don't want it in your face or in your mouth or whatever, then just keep it nice and tidy or deal with it and don't keep it nice and tidy. And then you have a man's beard <laughs> um, or 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 you could have what Kip or has. Or a boy beard. Yeah. It. Yeah. yeah boy so beard. It's a child beard. <laughs> my uh, my old uh, football coach, because I've had a beard forever. Like I, when I was, I think. I don't know, 15, 16 years old. Oh, really? I grew you like grow a goatee, a not a full beard, just more of like a goatee, yeah. but he always, but I tried to grow a full beard and he would call it a summer beard. He's like, cool summer beard, Mickler, summer here, summer yeah, there. Chops. That's what he'd always say. <laughs> summer here, summer there. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard um, that. So yeah, as far as the beard products, yeah, we had a top secret project going on. Top um, secret. Is so, this the reveal? Nah, it's the little bit of a reveal. It's the the hint, but uh, as you guys know, I work closely with Origin, and we are working on some formulations for some stuff. Nice. We'll uh, 
we'll leave it there. Stay tuned because it's going to be amazing. And you could uh, – just my input, you could maybe do caffeinated beard oil. So then that way I can stop drinking energy drinks and I just receive my caffeine through my beard oil. Well, they have an energy drink, so I'm not sure they'd want to compete directly <laughs> with true. that. That's true. <laughs> I, could, I could definitely talk with them about it. You know they have that stuff, right? Like caffeinated soap. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure yeah. they've got caffeinated. I'm Seeps sure they've got years. like CBD oil, beard <laughs> stuff. Like they've got it all. I'm sure. <laughs> all right. One more question or two? Yeah, I'll take a question. Yeah, that's all fine. Right. Andrew McLeod. 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 I'm just Thanks. glad I don't have to pronounce. Man, that that week that I had to do it, I'm like, God, <laughs> dang, this sucks. Now I know why I had a co-host. Not that I cared about your answers. I just wanted you to butcher the names and not me have to butcher them. Uh, it, it does add a, a level of um, pressureness. Yeah. <laughs> all the guys like hate me. They're like, damn it, Kip. Uh, all right. Things. Hey, look, if you want Kip to spell your name correct or pronounce your name correctly, put a – um. Put the like the the phonetic spelling or what it, isn't that what it's called the phonetic spelling yeah. where it's like just spelling. yes put the phonetic spelling and then I'm not gonna say that's guaranteed to get it right <laughs> but it gets it I may closer. not be able to read it right yeah <laughs> we still have that barrier of my uh, grammar to get over but are you, you have from a higher Utah? chance are you from Utah <laughs> town Utah not just Utah Small. oh that's right you're that's oh right. yeah I'm a fan. we've talked about this we talked about this you're from Monroe. <laughs> Monroe? Elsinore. Elsinore, yeah. which is right next to Monroe, right? Yeah. Even yeah. smaller than Monroe. <laughs> yeah. Well, you and me are, are dealing with the same ailment of small southern Utah, Utah schools, which is why we have such a difficult time with pronunciation. And it's mostly because I went to school with 20 other people, and none of them had any of these last names. It was all Peterson, Johnson, Sorensen. <laughs> yes. Jenkins. Jenkins. Yeah. Christensen or Christiansen? Yes, because a bunch of like, what, what is that, Dutch or what, like, what is the Danish? So Danish. if it's an E N, it's Danish. If it's O N, it's Swedish. And Swedish. Elsinore at one point was called Little Denmark. So all, yeah, all the Danes. I knew that they had. Uh, our our mutual friend Matthew Jenkins had explained all that to me on one of our trips, <laughs> and he explained everything about who settled that area. So, anyways, all right, question. Yeah. All right, Andrew, things or experience, which do you prefer to give over the holidays and why? Experience. Yeah. Yeah, also, so – Okay. Well, I was just going to say I totally agree after I read the question, and then I evaluated what I gave for the holiday season, and all of it was mostly things. And so in, retros yeah, in retrospect, I'm like, yeah, I agree with experience, although I did not act on that, and I should have probably done a better job on creating experience instead. Yeah, it's just e it's easier to give a gift than yeah. it is to like give an experience. Uh, so a couple of years ago, my wife and I, and of course the family and the kids and everything, we went to Hawaii, and that was phenomenal. It was unbelievable. We were there for two and a half, three weeks, and Big we Island. Christmas. Big Island, yep. On the uh, we were on the uh, Hilo side, yep. and it was so amazing. We rented this house that was in this Hawaiian village. And when I say Hawaiian village, I'm talking about the like Hawaiian village. So the villagers would look at us like, who are these Howleys? Like, who are these white people? It was awesome. We loved it. And they were all friendly. They were, they were great people, but it was, it was amazing. Um, yeah, so we did that. And so we did Christmas and New Year's there. And then this year, obviously, we're doing, doing it at home just with the move and everything else. Next year, we're thinking Scotland for Christmas and the holidays. So... We like the experiences, man. That's what it's all about. You know, we've got a short time on this earth, so we want to take advantage of it. Yeah. Well, and I think those experiences can be the traditions leading up to, you know, as well as the actual gifts themselves. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, you just get, like, I'm so disgusted with consumerism, <laughs> especially this time of year. Yeah. And I'm not immune to it. I get wrapped up in it too, but it's kind of disgusting when you think about how much we consume. Ugh. Mm. You know what's cool? And I and I heard this this past week, and I really, really like this idea. Uh, the individual suggested that what makes Christmas special for a child is because they receive things in which they could not get for themselves. And that has an element of magic to it. And then as we become adults, 
the gifts are all the things that we can already get, right? Like right. this is when Christmas starts getting difficult when you're in a position financially where you're like, what do I buy my wife? Because everything that she's ever needed, she has already purchased. She just buys it. And I've already done the same thing. And so, so there's this element of there's nothing that they could give me that I can't get myself. And that's where the true meaning of Christmas can actually give us that reflection and, 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 and if we focus on kind of like the, the Christ's role, right. For those that are religious, now we can get back that kind of that magical special aspect of Christmas, because there was a gift given that we cannot take mm. on ourselves. Yeah. And I like that. I like that, that is for, cool. the, for the Christian guys. So it was kind of cool. Anyhow, we have two questions from the IC. Should we swing them in really quick? Yeah. All right, yeah, let's, let's get it do. done. All right, Don uh, Mucunis. There's a quote from Zig Ziglar. By the way, B do have I've I've learned that like years and years ago, like 12 years ago. I'm assuming this is where it originated from. Maybe because Zig Maybe. Ziglar's like old school. You have to be before you can do and do before you can have. What does a guy have to do? Have to be in order to be a man? His character, his values, his ethics. So is that safe to say that Zig Ziglar originally kind of came up with the BDF? If he didn't concept? get it from somewhere else, yeah. I mean, that's that's a good source. I never for sure. knew Zig, I never heard the Zig Ziglar quote before. So yeah, uh, I was I. actually quite surprised. So what does a man have to do? Yeah, what does what does a guy have to be in order to be a man? So he's focused on that B do you have the B portion of this of this quote. The simple answer is to be a protector, a provider, a presider, or at least on the path in yeah. all ways. Yeah, that's part of the reason I train jujitsu. That's part of the reason that I live. That's part of the reason that I uh, try to gain new skills that'll help me be more effective and efficient with work. It's more. It's the reason I I believe that communication is so important because I can lead more effectively and live in integrity. Because if I have integrity, then I'll have more influence because my weight will carry word or my words will carry weight, and then I'll be able to have influence with other people. So the answer for me is that. A man should strive towards becoming a protector, a provider, a presider. Yeah. And everything I can think of, the virtues, the skill sets, the, the, the abilities, all falls under the umbrella of those three roles of that three roles. I play. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. I Would you agree with this, Ryan, that – because I think some guys, when, when they hear this quote or who you need to be and then do and have, like that concept of what is be – is kind of elusive and kind of, I mean, it's different verbiage. We don't use that term very often, you know, you are being or how you, sh how you, who, who you are being in life. And, and, and I would like to suggest that it's who you are in this moment. It's not a tomorrow thing. That's more of a do, right? I'm going to do these things. Being is how you show up right now, how you show up in every moment of life. And, and how you show up is everything from how you communicate with people, how your, your internal thought process is, how you interact. It, it's, it's, it's how you influence those around you at any given moment. So when I think of who I am being, it is how I show up in that meeting, how I walk down the hallway, what my thought process is. It is, it is, a, it is a state of being more mm -hmm. than it is anything else. Yeah, I believe that being is pretty encompassing. You know, it's got all the virtues and the skill sets and the action and the principles that you adhere to and how you're showing up to your point. It's it's kind of all encompassing of the way that we are present. Mm, I would say yeah, present. I like that. Right. Are you are you merely present? Like you're just kind of here. Like you're just the guy in the corner, kind of a dud, you're there. Or are you engaged? Are you do people know that you're there? Is your presence felt? Yeah. Is it, is it acted upon? Like, are you being that kind of person? Yeah. And, and I love that because think of different scenarios where the do, right? It's like, okay, I, uh, you know, protect, provide, preside, do, okay, I'm going to do martial arts or I'm going to the gym. So I'm physically in good shape or whatever. There's a big difference between going to the gym and working out and going to the gym and being present to the man that you are wanting to become. That mm -hmm. workout is now different, right? Your training yes. is now different. 
it's not just the action. It's how you show up in those moments of action. And how you tie it to meaningful things. So if you believe at your core that you are a protector, then going to train jujitsu isn't about training jujitsu. It's about making you a more capable protector. And that doesn't mean just physical altercation. That could be mindset. Sometimes I sit with somebody's arm around my neck and it hurts and I want to tap. And I'm like, you know, just sit here a little longer. Because the longer I can handle that, the guy that I was rolling with this morning, Alex Tuttle, had me in a wrist lock and it hurt. But I'm like, I'm not going to tap. Like, it wasn't injury situation, yeah. but it was painful. And I'm like, I'm not tapping to this. Like, I want to fully embrace this. Like, and I want to feel how long I can hold it. And you know what? Eventually, he actually let go of it because yeah. I waited through it. He didn't think it was working. So it's like everything that you now do becomes more significant. Even little, just little things becomes much more significant when you tie it to the person that you want to be. Yeah, I love this. At one point, we should wrap or rant on this a little bit in regards to all the aspects of being, because I, I don't, for whatever reason, I'm getting kind of fired up with this concept of yeah. having it being drive to purpose and being present. And it's, it's how you show up in, in the moments of action. All right. Last question, Tom Kingwell, what is the one thing you find or have found the hardest to change in the process of becoming the man you are today? And what systems and process did you employ to change it? So one thing you find and have found the hardest to change in the process of becoming the man you are today. Mm, I would say falling into old patterns has been difficult at times. Like I've created a lot of new patterns at this point. So yeah. it's not much I need to deal with anymore, but even still new habits become ordinary as well. And the, the, I, the phrase that uh, you, what got you here won't get you there has resonated with me. So sometimes we start doing something new, like well, let's take lifting weights or working out because that's an easy an example of this. Let's say a guy's listening and he's 50 pounds overweight. He's like, hey, I I want to I want to I want to be in shape. I want to lose 50 pounds. So for 2020, that's his goal. And he goes to work. He starts eating right. He's exercising. He's moving his body. He's doing all the things he needs to do. And then he loses 40 pounds and he's like, dude, this is awesome. I'm on the right track. I'm just going to keep doing the same thing because it's working. And then he just plateaus because we have the law of diminishing returns, right? So initially that first 20, 30, 40 pounds, that's easy. Like you could just think about that and that weight will start falling off, right? And then you start getting in that last like 15, 10, five pounds and what got you here won't get you there. So even though your habits, your new habits may be productive and they have for me, like I've implemented a lot of new things over the past five years that have really enhanced my life. But I realize that it's easy to coast when you have levels of success and you feel like this is good enough. Yeah. Or you, or you get frustrated and wonder why what you're doing is no longer moving you forward. Because what you were doing only had the capacity to get you to this point. If you want to get to that next point, you need to level up. And I'm not saying do the thing harder. I'm not saying that. Yeah. There might be a new skill set that you or, – or even just one skill that you haven't quite mastered or learned or are even aware of that will get you past that next plateau. Yeah. So that's been the hardest thing for me from – letting go of what you're doing – Maybe or what's been working for so long to saying, okay, I need to pivot and adjust my approach. Right. Because what we fall into is if it's not broke, don't you don't need to fix it. Yeah. Well, it may not be broken, but that doesn't mean it's gonna get you the results that you're after. Yeah. Like not broken is not a measurement of success. Like if you said, Hey Kip, you know, how's your refrigerator working? You're like, Well, it's not broken. I, I wouldn't think like you're real excited about that refrigerator. Maybe that's a bad example, <laughs> but your car, let's take your car. Yeah. Kit, man, how's your car? Like, I know you got a new car and like, you, you seem pretty excited about it. Well, you know, it's, it's not broken. <laughs> yeah. Like that's a, that's a, like an inferior metric, I guess you'd say. Right. Yeah. So, but we, we do that in our life. Like, Hey Kit, you know, how's things going? Ah, they're going okay. You know, I'm busy, but things are good. Yeah. They're okay. They're good. Yeah. Ordinary average. Meh. 
<laughs> but what it's, that's not a great metric to live your life by. Totally. Or if, if, if your game in jujitsu is, you know, maybe one of your games right now is, is you're just going for Kimuras all the time. Right. And it's working. Awesome. Eventually. Right. Everyone knows your game. Everyone right. knows that's what you're going for. And then you're like, Hey, how's that Kimura game working out for you? Uh, it's not working anymore. Right. I, it, if a new guy comes into the gym, it works great. Right. Right. But, but for me to get past this plateau in my training, I, I got to switch it up. Right. I, I got to start going for neck attacks or legs or, you know, change my game up a little bit because I plateaued or the environment has met me to where I am today. And for me to move beyond that environment, I now need to increase my game mm -hmm. right, and, and yeah. evolve and change and grow. Yeah. Mm. To his I last like question about what systems and processes. Yeah. Battle plan. Yeah. Just think about it, man. Every quarter, like every quarter you have to, you don't have to, but you have the opportunity to reevaluate that. And, yeah. and before every quarter we reevaluate, look at our new vision for ourselves. If that changes or tweaks at all. Um, and then we make our adjustments. It's like, okay, cool. You know, I, my last year's last year's goal was to hit 400 pound deadlift. Cool. Hit 400 pound deadlift. That's not the end. Like what's the next, the next thing. And maybe it's 425 pounds. Maybe it's not even deadlifting. Maybe it's that you want to do a marathon. Okay. That battle planning process and having that system in place is what allows you to continue to evolve and, and change and gives you the permission and then the strategy to be able to do it. Totally. And it's, and it's January one. Right. You guys are listening to this. If, if those visions aren't in place, those battle plans aren't in place. Don't procrastinate to next quarter or even next week. It's January one. So if you're listening to this before you go to bed tonight, figure it out. Right. What's your and vision? You know, what are you going to plan to do? And if you do that and you have your battle plan done tonight, it's probably going to be inferior to what it could be. That's OK, because it's superior to nothing. So, so get it done. And then if over the next seven days, you just need to go back and refine and tweak and hone it a little bit. Cool. But at least you've got the, the foundation, the basis for your improvement for the next quarter in place. Yeah. And, and to what you were saying earlier, you may not know what you need to tweak on that battle plan. You may not know what those adjustments need to be until you start taking some action because those are blind spots and you're not going to know what those blind spots are until you start taking some action anyway. Right. right. So yeah. if, if you guys need a battle plan or the battle planner, you can get actually those. Kip, I'm going to stop oh, go you ahead. just real quick. Yeah. Yeah. I only want to, I only want to share two resources for the guys today. And okay. I didn't tell you this. I should have told you this, but Perfect. in our no conversation, worries. this came up. The first one is the book sovereignty, the battle for the hearts and minds of men. That book is going to set you on course. If you're a man trying to imp improve in every capacity of your life. And at the end of the book, we have it very documented of how to create your own battle plan, your 12-week battle plan. So if you're interested in what we're talking about, you want to know how to do it, the book Sovereignty, you can get it on Amazon, wherever books are sold. Yeah, that's, that's your one. guide. Yep. Yes, correct. Number two, and actually a requirement within the first few days or weeks of being in the Iron Council is to read Sovereignty. And that's the second resource I wanted to talk with you about is the Iron Council. Uh, we are focusing on competition for the month of January. We are honing and refining and going through our battle plans. We are 500 plus men working together to establish these systems and procedures that we've been talking about in this podcast to make this year, 2020, your best year ever. It's not going to miraculously happen. I get that we all like the little catchphrases like 2019 was my warm up and 2020 was my year cool, bro. Like, what are you going to do different this year than last year? Uh, I don't know. Well then in 2021, you're going to say 2020 was my warm up. 2021 is my year. Like make this your year. Yeah. Join us inside the iron council. If you want the systems and the frameworks and the accountability and camaraderie and the brotherhood and everything else that comes with it and then do the work so that you don't have to keep saying that was my warm up year. That, that was my warm up year. And you say that for the next two decades, like you make this the year. If you don't mind me adding a thought for everybody, Ryan is, and everyone consider this really quick. What is the probable future? If you continue doing exactly what you've been doing, hmm. 
look into the future and say, hey, if I'm going to continue doing what I did in 2019 and I do the same thing in 2020, what is the probable future for me? And some of you may come to the hard realization is the probable future might be a divorce. The probable future might be relationships that you didn't address. The probable future might be loved ones passing away and you never being complete in those relationships. The probable future for a lot of us, if we're not leveling up in some way, is probably not ideal. So back to Ryan's question, what are you going to do about it? I like that. I like the framing on that. All right, man. I think that's a wrap. We got the first one done of 2020. Guys, we're glad you're on this uh, path with us. This is going to be a really good year. 2019 wasn't my warm-up year. I don't like that phrase. But I'm telling you, we are exponentially growing. We are continuing to grow. We are continuing to evolve. Uh, things are really looking good and are going to continue to grow uh, based on your responses, based on your engagement, and based on the plans that we have for Order of Man and Iron Council. And I thank you for being on the path with me and Kip and everybody else who's involved. Uh, we could not do it without you. We're glad you're here. And uh, let's let's get the year started off right. Anything else you'd add, Kip? Happy New Year. All right, guys. <laughs> get out there. Take action. Become the man you are meant to be.